It's our privilege tonight to have Mr. David Strait with us tonight. To me, he's one of the foremost people that knows what we need to know and how to do it. So we'll turn the time over to David Strait from Bend, Oregon. So can everybody hear? No, he's good. I heard, I heard it go up as I was talking. Um, the biggest thing is we got a lot of different people in the room at a lot of different levels in this process. And the, the most important thing is, like any school, we've got to have the basics. We've got to have the basics of what we're talking about or we can't move forward. So I'm going to try and cover a heck of a lot in three hours. I don't know if I can do it. Usually I talk a lot longer than that. I'm not going to be tripping over that, I'm sure. Excuse me, David, just a second. We'll take a, we'll take a break at, at 7.30 for those that are worried about that, like me. Okay. <laughs> you just you just tell me one, okay? So, one of the biggest problems I've seen with people across the United States is when they start getting into some of the groups, the Patriot groups, the Three Percenter groups, all, group, all kinds of different groups all over the country, constitutional groups, is they tend to abandon one jurisdiction and jump into the other. And that's kind of a big problem because all three jurisdictions have their place in what we do. Okay? And a lot of the a lot of the patriot groups and the three percenters and those kind of people, I love them all because I love everybody who stands up and says something because those are the people that are not only looking out for themselves, but they're looking out for others. So the more people stand up, the happier I am, okay? But a lot of the patriot groups and the three percenters, they've got a few things backwards, like I had when I was recently out of the military, you know, you you live your whole life towards patriotism. You go to the baseball games, you sing the song, you pledge your allegiance. But until you start learning and you have a real deeper knowledge and understanding about it, you begin to realize that you're pledging your allegiance to the very organization that is terrorizing you, the tyranny. It's terrorizing me. Now, is it bad? Was it created improperly? No. I believe our founding fathers were some of the most intelligent people in the world, and they taught us a lot. But I've asked hundreds of attorneys over the years and judges, what does the law mean? Where did its origins of the law come from? How did we arrive at this thing called law that holds a thumb down over us to makes us obey? Aren't we free in this country? How did we get to this point where everybody that I talk to is having a problem somewhere in their life? And I get some pretty crappy answers from attorneys and judges who you'd think would know what they're talking about, but they don't. One of the things, if you ever want to have some fun, go to some of the law schools, sit down with the administration, tell them you'd like to change careers and get your law degree, and ask them for a list of classes it takes to get a law degree, and then start analyzing those classes. 30% of them are electives. The rest is policy and procedures of the court, federal rules of civil procedure, federal rules of criminal procedure, how to pass the bar exam, and everything else to pretty much language classes. They call it legalese, so you can have a word for it. And what you learn is it doesn't matter if you're in Japan speaking Japanese, or in Germany speaking German, or anywhere else in the world. It doesn't matter what the language is in each one of those countries. Different words in the same language, like in English, determine which jurisdiction you're in. So the words we use get us in trouble because they don't teach us the differences in those words, in that language. So it gets us in trouble with the law. So to answer the question, I started researching. 
And in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God gave man dominion over the land and everything in it, the air and everything in it, and the water and everything in it. He gave man dominion over all three, and these became jurisdictions of law that were set aside by the Vatican in what we know as the first three testamentary trusts. So in the first trust, the Vatican in 1455 set aside the jurisdiction of the land. And if you know anything about trust and trust law, it's all ecclesiastical or canon law. It's the jurisdiction here that regulates trusts. So, in the jurisdiction of the land, they made King Ferdinand of Spain the trustee. And King Ferdinand was a good, honest man, good Christian man. He said, no, I'm not going to accept it. It belongs to all mankind. God gave it to all mankind in Genesis 1. And so, he passed a trusteeship to the jurisdiction of the land to mankind, all mankind in the world. That became known as common law because it was common to all of us. Okay? The jurisdiction of the air, the Vatican, they retained a trusteeship for themselves. They became the trustees of the jurisdiction of the air. And that became ecclesiastical law or canon law. Ecclesiastical law has to do with heaven and hell, lost souls and how to live righteously and not go to the devil and all kinds of things. But it also is trust. So this is love thy neighbor and do no harm. This is trust law. The jurisdiction of the water, the trusteeship was given to the monarchies of Great Britain. It became known as the Crown Inc., the world's first corporation, the Crown Inc. Today, that is owned by the Queen of England, the Queen of Holland. And it became admiralty law or commerce law. Yes. All the law that we operate in today, the UCC code, the USC code, the IRS code, all admiralty law. This country changed. It was founded on common law, changed to admiralty law, 1934. Okay? And then we adopted the UCC and other other various forms of admiralty law, but that became contract law. There has to be a contract. Well, the problem is, there's different types of contracts. And a true contract has to have eight elements to the contract, okay? But these attorneys, they'll do a contract that's really just a tacit agreement. And we'll talk about tacit agreement in a second. So, contract law, three testamentary trusts, set aside the first three jurisdictions. There's only three jurisdictions. The Bar Association uses the word jurisdiction to confuse the general public. So you don't learn this. They'll say it's in the city's jurisdiction, or the state's jurisdiction, or the federal government's jurisdiction, or some agency's jurisdiction. All they're really doing is replacing the word venue for the word jurisdiction. It's in the city's venue, or it's in the county's venue. And I call them on it in court, they go, oh, oh yeah, you're right. Why don't you just say it right the first time, right? So, juris means law. That's what that word means, law. Diction, what do you do with a diction? You look words up in the dictionary. Diction means words. The word you use determines the jurisdiction you're in. Okay? So, you can travel freely upon the roadways in your automobile or carriage with nothing more than your passport, and you have all the protection in the world. Your passport, if you pull your passport out, would be in the same pocket that this was in. <laughs> If you pull your passport out, the very first paragraph of your passport says, the Secretary of State of the United States of America. Now, doesn't that person have a little more clout than your police officer? Okay? A little higher authority. Hereby request 
all whom it may concern to permit the citizen or national of the United States named herein to pass without delay or hindrance and in the cause of need to give all lawful aid and protection. What does that say? When the police officer walks up, well, first of all, he put his red lights on behind you, right? You're going down the highway a little fast, he puts his red lights on behind you. He actually is committing a felony the minute he flips his lights on. He is creating an emergency where none existed, and that is a felony. It's against the law. But they know, they know you don't know that. They didn't tell you. But he created a felony where none existed. <coughs> Hi, guys. <coughs> so, he walks up to the window. And you roll your window down, and he says, can I have your driver's license, perfect insurance, registration? And if you just gather them all up and hand them to him, he's got tacit agreement of you being a citizen. Just from the mere fact that you handed it to him when he asked. Why? They're taught how to get, they're taught how to get tacit agreement of these three things within 60 seconds. And so is a judge when you go to court. And I'll, I'll, I'll do the court version here in a minute. The word citizen means employee. You're offered a benefits package. See, after the Revolutionary War, the king said, those British soldiers who would like to stay will leave here on these shores to provide the free men of America with essential governmental services. They will be citizens of America. Citizens, employees left to provide the free men with essential governmental services, okay? The word person, word person means Entity or office of. Person was created by your birth certificate. So I'm going to tell you a little story about mom. Mom walks into a family hospital. She's about ready to give birth. And all hospitals and churches in the United States were designated as foundling hospitals in 1912. The word foundling is a safe place to abandon a child. That's the word foundling. Happened in England. Everything that happens in this country happened in England about 100 years before. Is that F O U N D L I N G? It is. Perfect. So. The hospitals were designated as family hospitals. The mother walks in and she's declared indigent and a pauper. That makes me mad. I don't want to talk about it. She goes through childbirth. All she wants to do is get home to her bed with her brand new baby, right? That's all she wants. Well, she's just gone through a period of duress, a major medical procedure called childbirth probably under the influence of painkillers, and they hand her some papers to fill out and tell her, this is just to give your baby a name and get her registered. See? Well, <laughs> mom, under duress, signs it as an informant, an informant. The legal definition of the word informant is someone who gives up someone else to another. <coughs> she just signed away her title to her child, to the state. Does it have informant under the name you sign it? It's on every birth certificate. So you're, so you're signing as an informant? Sure. So that's the way you suppose? Yep. That part of it. It's not all of it. Wait, wait till I'm done. See how mad you get. Okay? <laughs> So, it's sent to the Department of Human Resources, 
and registered, bonded, insured. A CUSIP number is created. A CUSIP number is an investment control number regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. It is on bond paper. They bonded it through a bank. So your birth certificate is a bond paper, and on the bottom of it somewhere there's usually a bank name, and the letter's so small you can barely read them. And if you were born between 1933 and 1975, you were bonded for $630,000 and insured for a million the day you were registered at birth. Okay? If you were born after 1975, in 1975 they raised the amounts, you were bonded for a million dollars and insured for two. It doesn't end there. So maybe around age five you get a social security number. About the time you go, have to go to school, you need your social security number. Social security number is also a CUSIP number, an investment control number regulated by the SEC. Okay? It's a subservient slave ID number. Not the social security number. Social security, the correct name for that is subservient slave. Okay? So they create another custom number. Well, they create another bond and another insurance policy. Then you grow up 17, sign up for registration. All, all boys, anyway, have been signed up for registration for a number of years, and some of them go into the military. So they receive a military ID number, which just so happens to be another custom number. And in the military, you're bonded again, and your insurance is a $5 million policy this time because they plan on you getting knocked off. Okay? So who bonds you? The United States government. Through the Treasury. Is that what the name of no. We'll, we'll talk about that on my birth certificate. It's American State Bank. Some people, it's a great northern bank. On and on and on. Various banks. They just go to the bank for a bond. Okay? And we'll talk about what the bond is and that kind of stuff. So we'll get into it. But if you get an advanced degree in college, like I have several times, those student ID numbers are also custom numbers. See, they figure the more educated you are, the more money over your lifetime you earn, they bond and insure you again. So some of us have five, six, seven, eight pol life insurance policies on our, on us, in our name. And every time they create a custom number, that's all sold in the open market, buying and selling it. I can go to a website and type in any of your social security numbers, your birth certificate number, your military ID numbers, and I can show you what companies are buying and selling you today. And you know what? It doesn't end there. Even when you die, your SESTA QB trust, can I write that down somewhere? <clears throat> they call it, for short, they call it the PCT, the Public Charitable Trust. Because we give it to the government. And charity, have it. But anyway, um, so it's all bundled in the Sustic QV Trust. The Sus first Sustic QV Trust Act was in the year 1666. 666, maybe? Anyway, it's the Sustic QV Trust Act. The United States adopted it in 1933. Okay? And Everybody's birth got registered ever since. Bought and insured, sold on the open market. There's three ways the government can get at the money in that trust. And that trust lives on in perpetuity. Forever and ever and ever. But something happens to it when they receive your death certificate. We'll talk about that in just a second. But it lives on in perpetuity. Now, <clears throat> I kind of lost my train of thought here for a second. So, anyway, with the Sesta QB Trust, we literally, every single person in this room is worth millions and millions of dollars. Now, up until a few years ago, I knew it existed because I read Canon Law. Talks all about it throughout Canon Law, all about Sesta QB Trust. I read the Sesta QB Trust Acts of 
1707, and you know, we've had all these acts over the years, and I've read them all. And so I knew about them, I knew they existed, but it was very difficult to prove. How does immigration, there's, there's more people that bring in here to raise up their numbers? Well, I'm just curious. It does, but that's just a transfer of assets. See, because any United Nations country, all 174 of them, doesn't matter if you're in Canada or wherever, Australia, Japan, all 174 countries operate under the United Nations, and they all do the same thing now. They've all standardized. Okay. Even Iceland? Nice no. Okay. Or Bulgaria, or there's, you know, 203 countries in the world, and 174 of them right now. So. I'm, I'm amazed because it used to be in the 190 range. And a lot of countries like Iceland pulled out of it. Bulgaria pulled out of it. So there's countries. Uh, if I got some air conditioning. <laughs> I wore way too warm a shirt, I guess. Woke up and saw it was raining. Anyway, uh, all of us have this huge investment account. And I knew about it, but I didn't know how big it truly was. And my very first federal case was a young lady named Jamie Faye Kobat. And uh, she had, she's a, a grandmother, and had an autistic son and went through a divorce and her ex-husband happened to work for a police department as a mechanic and knew everybody in town and later mar married the district attorney and was pretty connected, but he's kind of narcissistic and he beat her up a few times and stuff and she moved three hours away over the mountains and, and uh, she had an autistic son with him and they had you know visitation rights back and forth and all that stuff. But over a period of about 10 or 12 years, he had four re police reports against, she had four police reports against him for coming over her house, taking her son, beating her up, all kinds of stuff. One time, he kicked the door at 2 o'clock in the morning, went right in the kid's bedroom, took the kid, put him in the car, started the car, started backing up. She runs out in her pajamas, she puts her hands on the trunk to stop the car. The table's not very good. But well, he didn't push any harder. Anyway, and he ran over in the car. Right over the top of her. She fell down. He just went right over the top of her. And uh, she, because she was a single mom raising an autistic son, she was eligible for her Social Security. And she got Social Security benefits on him. And it, it was pre-SSI, they call it. And then she had gotten some tenant benefits, which are state food stamp benefits, and medical. Because her son was going to the doctor all the time. You know? Anyway, after her ex husband married the DA, they did something a little crooked. When the kid went to visit, they registered him for school. Not that he ever attended there. He went home, but they used the school registration as proof that the kid was living with him and then found her for fraud for receiving those benefits when he was not in her house. Now, there's nothing illegal about what she did at all. I mean, I've checked all the laws on it. I've checked with the agencies on it. Nothing illegal. But her evidence, their attorneys, when they filed a motion to put her evidence in, the judge suppressed it. When her attorney asked for witnesses to testify, they suppressed all of her witnesses. This is known as railroading, to lead somebody down a narrow path or rail to a predetermined outcome or conclusion. And then when she finally went to trial, the prosecutor spent three and a half days prosecuting her, making her look like the worst person on earth. Not one single first-hand witness, just a letter from her ex-husband, he didn't even show up in court. One letter, no real proof, no nothing. 
denying all her evidence, denying all her witnesses. Jury, uh, she got her trial was four days, three and a half days. The prosecution presented their case. She got two hours. Jury deliberated, came back in about an hour, got her guilty on all four counts. I met her about 30 days later, after the trial, after she'd been found guilty, but before her sentencing. Okay? And we went to work. <laughs> her and her husband came up in a motorhome, parked in the Walmart parking lot, and every day I drove over there and I taught her, started teaching her, started going through her good evidence. I got 300 pieces of evidence on her behalf, including affidavits of witness testimonies that the court during her trial denied. But I got put onto the record. See? And then we show up for sentencing. And we went through sentencing. In the very first sentencing, we got two of her charges dropped immediately because we kind of paid them in advance. All right? He knows this story because I spent time telling him, but very good. We paid them in advance. So we get into the sentencing here, and I said, wait a minute. You know, these are paid in full. You can't charge somebody for something that's already paid. So he dropped two counts right away. And then he suspended sentencing for a month, and we went after him some more, and so on and so forth. Now I do it kind of all in one shot, what I used to do in little pieces, okay? But, to make a long story short, all four of her felonies went away, and she's home today, and she calls me every day, and tells me thank you, because she was going to get 20 years. So, can it work? Yeah. What did we do? First thing we did is file an affidavit of repudiation of citizenship with the State Department. That's what the United States Code says you have to do. Most of these people that are trying to say they're American state nationals have never done that. Therefore, they are not American state nationals. Now I'm going to qualify that. They really are. They never were citizens in the first place. See? But the government holds this to a tacit agreement. Of this. So I told you how a police officer gets your tacit agreement of these three things in the first 60 seconds. He says, give me your driver's license, purpose, registration, and insurance. You hand them to him. You've got a tacit agreement that you're a citizen. All he's got to do is look at your driver's license and your name spelled in all caps. It's got your address on there with your zip code. Now he has a tacit agreement that you're a person or resident. The legal definition of the word resident is Someone there temporarily to do business. Stupid. <laughs> Someone there temporarily to do business. By the very use of your zip code, the federal government put you in Washington, D.C. There's 325 million of us that all live in Washington, D.C. Every time we use a zip code, put it on a letter. We just reside, as you guys are, in Utah temporarily to do business. So now they have full jurisdiction over you. There's nothing you can do about it. You were about to say the three ways that the, they can take the money. I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. The three ways they take the money, they find you guilty of a misdemeanor or a felony. They can get at your money. They take your kid because they own it. They have title. Do you understand when it, what happens when CPS knocks on the door? They got a couple of police officers, sometimes a California SWAT team. And they kick your door in, and they walk in, and they steal your child. 99 times out of 100, they don't even have a warrant. And even if they did have a warrant, it's an invalid warrant. Why? Because our Constitution says it must be from an Article 1 or an Article 3 court. The warrant must state the address to be searched, the specific location to be searched, like I'm going to search her bedroom or his bedroom, and she's supposed to say what they're searching for, drugs, things like that, okay, whatever. And that ain't even good enough. It's supposed to be backed up by a sworn affidavit 
or claim sworn under the penalty of perjury or a sworn testimony in a court of law under the penalty of perjury, and then it's a valid warrant. They show up with something that's about as good as a blank piece of paper, doesn't mean diddly squat in law, and they hand it to you and they just walk in the door. You don't even get a chance to read it, right? No, you're supposed to have time to read it too, in full. They're supposed to wait for you, but do they? No. And I guarantee it's not even from a de jure court. There's only two de jure courts. State Supreme Court, Federal Supreme Court, Article One Court, and Article Three Court. That's it. All these other courthouses are all privately owned corporations. In fact, the one here in Cache County, there's seven counties, all owned by the same guy. The headquarters of the corporation is in Nogamita. You call it government? Really? Okay. What is the police force? I hope somebody in here is an attorney or a prosecutor or a judge or a state legislature. Because I love standing in front of the state legislatures. I've spoken at the state capitals, several of them, and let them know the bullshit that we're under. And I don't mean to cuss, but I get kind of mad. Once you study it as much as I do, you really learn the true amount of the fraud. We haven't had a de jure government in this country since March 22nd of 1861. In fact, really, just a little bit before that, when a gentleman named Abe Lincoln took office. See, Abe Lincoln is not the wonderful president that tells no lies and chopped down a cherry tree that we're out led to believe, right? When Mama Dave, little children are taught to put on a play four score and seven years ago. Right? Do you know the Gettysburg Address was a trust? If you know what trusts are, what the elements of a trust are, you can well, read the Gettysburg Address. And it was all laid out as a public trust. Okay? Lincoln was a pretty good attorney. But, you know, he was the governor of Illinois before he ran for president. And he was a follower of Karl Marx in 1848. And he ran for president several times and lost. Why? Because the people didn't want him to be a president because he was a communist. If you read letters and journals of people who lived during the time, that's what they said about it. And he passed several communistic, law, communistic laws. Lips are sticking together. And when he was governor of Illinois. That's why Illinois is still screwed up today. Okay? And that's why the United States is still screwed up today. You know, I grew up to worship Abe Lincoln. I thought he was awesome. And the little kids are taught persistence. You know, he ran for president six times, but he finally made it. So you guys just hang in there. So they're taught persistence by Abe Lincoln, by our school system. Everything they are taught in school is a lie. I can go through their historical textbooks and show you that it's all lies. Why? Well, now I'm getting off the subject. I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> so, they get this tacit agreement. So how do they get a tacit agreement in a court of law? Let's just pretend it's a courtroom. I'm the judge, okay? Every, the court starts at 10 in the morning. You guys are all sitting there at 9.45, twirling your thumbs, waiting for the judge to walk in. He turns the doorknob to walk in, and the bailiff says, All rise for the Honorable Judge, David Strait. And everybody jumps up off their seat, stands up. He just got a tacit agreement there, you're a citizen. Because employees stand when their boss walked into the room. Isn't he our public servant? Didn't we elect him to be a public servant? Or maybe he was appointed to be a public servant? Depending on the court, okay? We, the people, are the boss. We don't stand when the judge walks into the room. First of all, he's not a judge. Not in any of these local courts, only in the state Supreme Court and the federal Supreme Court. <laughs> then they're judges. And in that room, I will call them a judge or your honor. But in the lower judge courts, it's Mr. Administrator. Okay, and I'll tell you why. What is the legal definition of the word court? 
If you look in the legal dictionary, like Black's Law, Fourth Edition, or Bobert's, it says C Bank, C Post Office. All courts in the United States were created as United States District Postal Courts. If you walk into a post office, you can buy a money order that is backed by actual silver and gold, real money, today. Because all post offices, Benjamin Franklin set them up as banks. He set up the post office in the United States. So all post offices were banks, all courts were banks and post offices. If you look up the word judge, it says see banker, see postmaster. But if you look up the word attorney, it says see actor. <laughs> see actor. Might as well be Brad Pitt or Tom Hanks or Tom Selleck. Doesn't matter. And a lot of them win some Oscars. They're good at it. They became excellent wordsmiths. Okay? They learned the language. They spent years in law school learning language. And it even has a name. It's called legalese. It doesn't matter what language it's in. English, Japanese, French. It doesn't matter. Okay? Each of these jurisdictions uses its own words. And if you learn the language and you say the right words, you stay in that jurisdiction, you take ownership of it. Mankind was given the dominion, we have dominion over all three jurisdictions. So you learn language, like traveling upon the roadways in an automobile or carriage. A car, the word car is short for carriage. That is this jurisdiction. What is this one? I'm driving or operating a motor vehicle. Now, who has to have a driver's license? Anybody know who has to have a driver's license? Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> You've taken this class before a couple of times. <laughs> okay, it is somebody driving an Uber, a taxi, a bus driver, school bus driver, somebody employed to do it or charging a fee for their service. Hauling passengers for hire is what they call it in law. Passengers for hire. A truck driver, somebody hauling goods or services for resale <coughs> in international commerce. Not the ones that go from Salt Lake to Logan and back to Salt Lake and to Logan again and back to Salt Lake. You know, it's ones going to Idaho or to California. Interstate commerce. Each state is an independent nation state united for a cause so that our federal government could provide the states, the people thereof, we the people, with 19 essential governmental services. 18 of them are clearly listed in the Constitution and one is in the preamble. But there's 19 essential governmental services that we agreed to pay for and they agreed to provide. How many do they provide us with? <laughs> Thousands, and they force us at gunpoint to pay for it. Right? So, how do they get at the trust money? Misdemeanor or felony? If they take your kid and you have both the husband and the wife, trust money. And if you die, when you die and you receive, they receive a death certificate, your estate is balanced. Let's talk for a second about Federal Reserve notes, okay? It's called, they're called legal tender. If you read books like uh, Modern Money Mechanics, put out by the Federal Reserve of Chicago, wrote that book. But each reserve writes their own book. They all say the same stuff, so read one and read them all, okay? Legal tender. Tender does not pay a debt. It tenders it to a later date. All debts are kept track of. Banks keep track. The Federal Reserve gets a statement. It gets attached to your <coughs> custom numbers. When you die and they receive a death certificate, the estate is settled. All your debts are finally paid. Do the companies you have the debts with get paid along the way? Yeah, because they just go use this with somebody else that they're doing business with. So they're not injured. But the IMF, they just print up the money for about three cents. And it goes on their books, and your estate gets sell, settled. So the millions of dollars that you have in the Cess QV Trust by the time you die, that gets balanced out. 
It's a balance sheet. The debits and credit gets balanced out, the state probate settled, the state settled, and a sweep account is created. Trust lives on in perpetuity, it lives on forever. They just create a sweep account. What is a sweep account? Anybody know? You go to your bank, you open a checking account, a savings account, you say, I'd like my savings account to be listed as a sweep account. You write a check uh, uh, or something, uh, ask for a payment of, say, $97. They take $100 out of your checking account. They move three of it into savings, and people use it as a for savings plan. <clears throat> so this remains, the balance remains the same, but it's still invested out there on the American economy. And by the time you die, it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And the sweep account is taken and it goes right in the treasury. They call that off-book funds. And if you look at the GAC reports and others, you'll start to see where the money is. See, our federal budget is about $4 trillion. And out of income taxes, they collect corporate and business, personal, they collect about $900 billion. Where do you get the rest? <clears throat> Well, there's almost three trillion left. Where'd they get it? Okay. The Chinese. No, they don't. <laughs> Chinese have the same problem. Did you print it? No. They take it out of our SESQB trust. In fact, the Department of Fiscal Services says the Department of Justice is the biggest contributor to the federal budget by far. By far. In fact, the 990 billion isn't even there. All that went directly to the IMF to pay for interest on our bankruptcy. So no taxes go to our federal budget. That just goes to IMF for interest on our bankruptcy. Everything of the federal budget comes out of Sesta QB trusts. Now, the Department of Fiscal Services says the Department of Justice is the biggest contributor by far. Where do, where do they get their money? our court system throughout the United States. See, when I was doing Jamie Bay Kogat's case, we started researching fidelity, and I showed him all the documentation this morning. And we went through all the paperwork, and I showed him all the treasury bills that had been cashed in, and it was 300 here at 25,000 apiece, and 100 here at 10,000 apiece, and pages after pages after pages of them as they were liquidating her trust so that they could take money out of her account, and it was liquid capital when the court found her guilty and sentenced her. And we saw exactly how much her account was worth, you remember? It was 28 billion, yeah, something like that. and then it went up to 35 billion because we extended the sentencing date. Just one little grandma. That's how much was in her account. But see that $630,000 note, and then the $1 million note on the Social Security, and then she got a degree, another million dollars. Those bonds, at, over a long period of time of 50 plus years, kept growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. United States Treasury bonds is a full faith and credit of the United States government based upon each one of our labor or the subservient slaves. If that doesn't make you bad, I don't know what else you it sounds like a pipe dream but when you see the real figures. I mean, it's, we never hear anything about any of this. No. But see, I can show you all the documentation and all the... I went through pages and pages yeah, of documentation with him this and Jim this morning. So, we, need, we need to confront some of our leaders about some of this stuff and show them we, we know what the hell is going on because... Uh, what does it say? It sucks about the truth sentence. Well, we don't think they all know? A lot of them don't know. No. Here, here's the thing. If you're going to pull off a con on somebody, let's say you're one of the Council of 13, and you're going to pull off a con on somebody, or a large group of people, let's just say it takes 50 people that you've got to hire to pull off that con. If you told them what the entire con is, they're not going to do it. Why? Because people are basically good, honest, moral people. That's been my experience throughout my lifetime. Most of you guys are good, honest, moral people. There's a few of them you have a question, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But anyway, they are. 
So if you told them what the con was and that you're going to be ripping off a whole bunch of people, they'd all quit and go home and nobody would do it. But if you compartmentalize them and you give the police officer his little job duties and you give the court clerk their little job duty and the county somebody their little job duty and the judge a little job duty and the attorney's a little job duty and so on and so forth right up through your state legislature. Now all of a sudden you have all of them who can go to work every day, get their paycheck, go home at night, smile with their kids, and sleep well, and go back to work the next day because they don't know the big picture of the con. And let me tell you something. The government hides everything in plain sight. Everything. They publish everything. But they'll publish a little bit here, and there's one piece of the puzzle, and a little bit here. And as Edward Mandel House wrote, because he's the one who thought of this plan between 1912 and 1933 and pulled it off over three different presidents. As he came right out and said, only one in a million will ever learn it. And then we have plausible deniability. Because we did it over uh, several administrations, several presidents, several this, several that. There wasn't any one person responsible. Well, except for Edward Mandel House. So you know what he did? He refused to take a position in government. So he wasn't responsible, right? But he's the one that gathered all the bankers up at Jekyll Island and created the Federal Reserve under the Aldrich Plan, the big octopus. Yeah. And he's the one that had Woodrow Wilson's ear. See, he was a big oil man from Texas. And he had Woodrow Wilson's here, and he got Wilson to sign over the government. Wilson's last speech, he stood up and said, if there's only one thing I regret as being president of the United States is that I gave away our country to a small group of greedy men. He admitted giving away our country. During that time, they created family hospitals. The whole plan, it had to start from family hospitals, and it worked its way right up, up to a Eisenhower and his New Deal, and we have the whole Sesta QB Trust Act to thank for it. So all his whole plan was a con job, and so many people pulled it off that everybody had their own little compartmentalized piece. Nobody actually did it. Who do you hold accountable, right? You can't hold him accountable because he wasn't in the government in the first place. Yet he was in the White House every day for about 20 years. But he didn't need the money, so he refused to take a federal position. See? So, anyway, where am I going with this? It's too hot, I can't think. <laughs> um, Kick off your shoes. Huh? Take off my shoes? Yeah, cool out. You don't think these insulated hunting boots are <laughs> making me sweat? <laughs> um, so Genesis 2 7. And I, God, created man from the dust of the earth, and I breathed into his nostrils the gift of, of life, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So, what do we got to do? We've got to separate ourselves from here and be the state national. And we were intended to be. All of our founding fathers were state nationals. We each lived in a nation state. We were a state national. State nationals were the arbitrators and creators of government. We, the people, created government. The U.S. citizen was created by government, by the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. They created government. They were created by government. A person, thanks to the Reconstruction Acts, Congress redesignated the word person to mean entity or office of. And the resident is someone there temporarily to do business. We need to inhabit the state we're in. 
we're all Californians, Oregonians, Utahns, Wisconsinites, Floridians, Massachusetts. We are the people of the state, the we the people. We've never even done what it took except not knowing any difference, so we mistakenly check some box somewhere. But we've never gone through the process, unless there was somebody born in another country in here that went through the process. Anybody? You all born here? So none of us in this room has gone through the legal process to even be a citizen in the first place. But in the United States Code, it says we must repudiate it if we don't want it with the United States Secretary of State. <clears throat> Okay. And then we can jump back as a state national that we were intended to be in the first place and stop being this. Because the Supreme Court of the United States says, since governments chose to incorporate themselves, they must abide by all the same rules as any other corporation. The rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances, and policies, and even executive orders are not law. They are corporate bylaws. So can a Walmart employee show up at your house, kick your door in and steal your kid when no due process of law? No. What would you do? You'd probably pop him right between the eyes and put his name. See, he's a trespasser. He's kidnapped. He's creating all kinds of felonies. Right? So they can't do that. But the Supreme Court says, since governments chose to incorporate themselves, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation. All right? It's not being de jure. What is de jure? Of we the people? And became de facto. De facto is without fact. That's when they started coming up with the term. Government operates through the consent of the governed. If we are in jail, we consented to be there. If they took our kids, we consented for them to take them. If we have to pay a ticket, we consented to pay the ticket. Isn't it contract law? We are supposed to have a viable contract. So what do they make you do? Maybe sign the ticket. Now they said they don't even have to do that. The attorneys I figured out that all they need is your tacit agreement to be in these three things and do whatever they want to you with no due process. Doesn't contract law say contracts need to be fully disclosed? Absolutely. Sign? And or you can make an addendum to the contract? That's right. Sign? Absolutely. But here's the problem. Ever since April 11, 1953, the government, federal government took over our educational system under the auspices of standardized testing and standardized students. And so a student in California is equal to a student in New York or a student in Florida. They all get the same textbooks. And they paraded a little lady named Jane Spalding around for two years to all the states. And Jane Spalding is the sweetest little, if you can picture the perfect teacher lady in your mind, close your eyes, picture her, that was Jane Spalding. Sweet little innocent lady, and they paraded her around the states under the auspices of standardization and that the states would receive federal money. So the states signed on to it, and she became the secretary of the Department of Education on April 11, 1953. Well, 49 days later, they fired her and they put in Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller a son of one of the most prominent banking families in the United States, a member of the Federal Reserve Banking family. And his first speech, his accepted speech, he said, I consider this the greatest position in our government by far. And the camera flashes started going off. And they said, the reporter said, you mean even more important than the President of the United States? And he said, absolutely. He said, you give me one generation, and I'll change the minds, and therefore the direction of the world. And he did. In fact, by 1961, it was already changed and done. It only took him eight years. She, gave, she lasted 49 days. They paraded around for two years. OK? 
Okay? What year was that? 1953. Okay? I think the Department of Education was created until uh, Jimmy Carter in 1970. Nope. April 11, 1953. Look it up, Jane Spalding. Nelson Aldrich Rock. Okay. okay. What are some other things that happened between 33 and 53? How many people think we won World War II? Just dropped a bomb on Hiroshima, right? We didn't win World War II. We signed the United Nations Treaty. Every country we were at war with was a member of the United Nations. Even us. We were members. Germany was members. Japan was members. We signed the United Nations Treaty. End World War II. Well, what happened then? We gave them Manhattan Island. Or G you can say his last name. Giuliani. <laughs> Stands up on camera and he says, I don't have any control over Manhattan Island, just the rest of New York City. Manhattan Island is owned by the United Nations. So it's 50 miles on each side of the Mexican border. 50 miles on each side. How did we give away 50 miles of Mexican land? <laughs> that didn't cover that side of the border. That's true. Okay, how did we give it away? Because they were a United Nations country too and they signed on to it. Now do we know about it? No. Because nothing, no event has really happened in that area to know. But in 19, what? Or 2011? Twin Towers? New York City learned how well, little control they had over Manhattan Island. Okay. New York City learned a big lesson that day. Okay? So when you learn history, <laughs> you start to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And when you learn history and fight the law and the courts. Uh, I listened to Alex Jones the other day. He said all that immigration is all through the United Nations. They want to bring 600 million refugees to the U.S. by the year 2050. The Sec million. Secretary of the Treasury is not paid by the United States government. They're paid by the IMF. Okay? What was his comment I didn't quite hear? I said that according to, according to Alex Jones, uh, that all this UN stuff, they want to bring 600 million refugees to the U.S. by 2050. I don't think things are going to stay together that long, but this immigration deal, Dave Hodges, they're, they're training down El Salvador. You look at these groups that are coming. There, a lot of the guys are all military age. When you couldn't buy 22 shells, Obama was stockpiling billions of rounds of ammo to give these. Remember, he bragged about having an army as big as the U.S. Army, civilian. Well, that's what they're doing. And uh, you need to show them that picture you showed me about Gitmo since Trump got in. <laughs> Trump spent billions of dollars at Gitmo, and there's, a, you know, the big thing against Kavanaugh. Uh, they asked him about military tribunals. Already they're, they're throwing them in the Gitmo because the, the courts are so corrupt. What he's saying, they can get them for treason and Hillary can go down and be thrown in there and seize all their assets and end the story. We don't have to deal with any courts or Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals or attorneys. But uh, at 600 million they want to bring in the U.S. if they have their way. 600 million. Yeah. So you think this immigration is going to go away. It's not about to helping the kids and that. It's about that destroy it's it. about destroying America. Yeah. We're on to the bastards. That's what it comes down in, to. In December, right before President Trump's inauguration, that is a picture, of, an aerial picture of the buildings at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. That's the picture today. See how much construction has gone on down there? They've already put in 3,000 pedophiles in that prison. I've heard that they got the latest hospital in the world. Huge. I've got a friend that's down there right now. He was telling me about it, and I had to had to do some research. That's just what I do. But that's incredible. Some of the stuff. This gentleman has got some powerful information. 
A lot of documentation, huh? We were yes. going through documentation yes. for hours this morning. Just well, I was just throwing it out there too. Well, it's part of the truth set us free. We do not realize how powerful those words are. Uh, uh, in that one about the DNC that you talked about, uh, you know, where about the Constitution and stuff. And, uh, you were, you really want to bring that subject to us? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I want to confuse. I want to, I want to confuse them with the facts, not hearsay. <laughs> okay, I. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'd like you to tell us what goes on at your death with this trust account. At your death? Yeah. Did I not cover that? You did, but a I sweep didn't. account and so created so that just goes, funds government. It goes all goes to the IMF for who's government. Goes into the United States Treasury's general fund. And the books are kept on the GAC, which is an off book registry. So it's not traded with the uh, stocks, stock market? Prior, when it's in the SESTA QV Trust, it's traded. So but anybody money can own that paper? Huh? Anybody can own that paper if they buy it? Sure. What about yourself? By an internet connection on this, I'd show it to you right now, but I don't. I'd have to do it on my phone and nobody can see it anyway. But you can pull up fidelity.com and work your way through their website just to find it eventually. But you can go on gmeiutility.org and it's pretty easy to find. All you do is hit the little magnifying glass in the upper right hand corner and it pulls up a little search box and it says search for an LEI. And you type in your social security number or your birth certificate number or your military ID number and it'll pull up a whole list of companies. I pull it up for him. He can verify what I'm saying. You, you think this is all hearsay and he, and he shows you the whole hard fact. You think we've been, we've been had like nothing we've ever been imagined. I mean, okay. And you can pull up a whole list of companies that are buying and selling you today. Ever since your birth certificate was created, you have been sold for United States Treasury bonds. See, the minute they bond you with that bank, all that means is they're creating, if you're born since 75, they're creating $1 million of United States Treasury bonds. And those are available now for sale. Every child that's born, another million is available for sale. They just create Treasury bonds. And any grandmother or company, usually it's companies, go ahead. What is the balance of trust still when it comes to state national? They still exist. Do they still trade? Even though they're more state national? Lives on in perpetuity. I could pull up my dead father and my dead wife's father, and I can show you how that they are being traded today. I can put their social security numbers in. It lives on in perpetuity. My dad's been dead since 1989. Now I can make it even worse for you if you want. We're good. Okay. We're good. Go up for one thing. Yes, we are a little bit. Yeah. I don't even know. So what are we searching? Well, I would search for Guantanamo yeah. pictures. I thought I ended that. So uh, <clears throat> I get all this. Um, we didn't have it. How did we become a state national? Affidavit of Hi. Two old friends, is that one? <laughs> that one's for you. All right. So yeah, we've been having we've been having big time. Where do we go from here? What do we do? To become a state national? I believe there's three documentations you should do. Why do I believe in three? I Three is everything in the law. The rule of three matters in everything you do in the law. A judge can ask you something three times. You've got to tell a judge something three times. Three pieces of document documentation previously done in the law. Let's talk about that. Let's get rid of this stuff. Right. Rule of three matters. So 
So, I'm getting off track pretty easy. It's a problem with three hour classes. I can cram so much into you when you talk for 16 weeks. I can stand up here for 16 weeks straight and talk here. And I couldn't tell you everything. I've got 300,000 pieces of documentation on this computer on the iCloud. 300,000 plus pieces, more than that now. So, rule of three. What was I getting at? Three documents. Three documents. Three documents. Okay, thank you. The three documents I believe you need. The United States Code says you must do an affidavit, I'm going to shorten this, of repudiation to the State Department, Secretary of State, Secretary of State, man, I came up with the All right, been talking for 10 days straight. Hmm? We don't have a Secretary of State, so who do we go to? Yes, you do, it's the United States Secretary of State. Oh, okay. United States Secretary of State. What well, used to be John Kerry and Hillary Clinton? Do you know who it is now? Anybody know who it is now? Pompeo. 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 Okay, have to do David of repudiation. If you have the ability to, and most of us Mormons do because we're good at genealogy, you do a patent of nativity. I can show you mine. All you're trying to do is show that your lineage existed in this country, and you only need one line to do it, to show that your lineage existed in this country before government was formed in this country. You've been here longer than they have. So you have priority. Then, a deed of reconveyance. A deed of reconveyance. What is that? Simple. Take your dog, law, dog Latin glossa name. Dog Latin glossa. Anybody know what dog Latin glossa is? I'm sure most of you do. <laughs> it's your all capital letter name. All capital letters. You were registered at birth as a vessel. As a vessel, you came through the birth canal. You delivered at the dock tour. <laughs> you were issued a bill of lading. You were taxed. Okay? You think you think our federal government is trying to hide the fact that we are in admiralty jurisdiction? Can't be that far back, come on. Time marches on. Taking all your all caps name. Do you think the federal government is hiding the fact that we're in admiralty law? That's a brand new federal courthouse in Miami, Florida, under construction. Uh -huh. Where's that too? Miami? It's a ship at four docks. Okay? That ain't the only one. Start looking at it. Get on Google. Start looking at some of the pictures of the federal courthouses. Even the Portland one, the Portland, Oregon one, which has been there forever, it's just a square building on the outside. But when you walk in the lobby, and you walk through the front doors of the building, it's six stories tall of glass, open atrium in the inside, but the wall of all courthouses is curved like a ship. 
And that building's been there 100 years. Okay. So your all caps name is a, you take your all caps name and spell it every which way you think you can. See, in the military, they put your last name first, your first name, and middle. You want to spell it in full. You want to spell it with your middle initial period. You want to spell it every way you can think of spelling it. And you put it on our deed of reconveyance, and you go file with your county, and you get a county staff on your copy. Okay? Why? Why? Because this is what we were really getting to. Now, is that filed with the county attorney's office? Or no. Or the county, recorder? county recorder's office on the land, just like the deeds and are filed. Okay. through tacit agreement, they pr first presume that you're a citizen, a person, and a resident as CPR, because we all need it when they're done. Okay. <coughs> then they assume you were a drug dealer when you were not, or you were speeding when you were not, or you beat your kid when you didn't, or whatever the case may be, they're making an assumption of guilt. Then they base it all on hearsay, and the American Bar Association has a nice little motto. If you read their journal every once in a while, they just throw it down in the little, lower left-hand corner, and it says, no fact or truth shall be tried in court. What? Not any reaction on you guys? Are you all dead? No fact or truth shall be tried in court. See, so you hire an attorney, like them or not, they might be your next door neighbor and your best friend, okay? But the minute you hire an attorney, you're declared incompetent, a ward of the state, unable to speak for yourself. You automatically are a citizen, person, or resident. See, in the law it says, <laughs> Under attorney, who can an attorney represent? You look that up in the law. It says an attorney can represent a corporation, an entity, a minor, somebody infirmed, or somebody incompetent. Anything excluded from the law, it does not belong there. That's a rule. Anything excluded doesn't belong there. So it only says what? A corporation, an entity, a minor, somebody infirmed, or somebody incompetent. Does it say a man or a woman anywhere? An attorney cannot represent a man or a woman. They cannot represent a man or a woman. That's why they represent you, represent you under your person, your persona. Anybody start to get pissed a little bit? <laughs> Been for a long time. Let's talk about Jamie's nephew. About a year after I saved her life, and she didn't have to go to 20 years in prison, I get a call from her nephew. Jamie hadn't seen her nephew in a couple of years. That weekend, she happened to go to the family reunion. She heard a story of what happened. And she said, you better call David tonight. He had court on the day morning. The family reunion was that weekend. Nathan was a young man, fairly recently married, 
had two young babies, about 10 years out of high school, he had a good job, rented a nice little house in town, nice car, and he went to Safeway. And while he was in Safeway, he ran into two old friends from high school he hadn't seen in 10 years. And he said, hey, why don't you come over to our house tonight? We'll have a beer. They were beer drinkers. We'll have a beer and catch up. And these two friends showed up pretty well toasted. And then when they walked through the door, the good host Nathan was handsome another one. And one of them was about this tall, and the other one was bigger than him. <laughs> He's a pretty big guy. <laughs> and they kind of got a little belligerent with each other, and Nathan said, you know, I haven't seen you guys in 10 years. You're going to act like that around my wife, and my kids are sleeping in the back. I suggest you just leave. And they walked out the door. They went to their car, the little one got in the pasture's side, the big one, and he goes back to Nathan's house, and he walks up to Nathan, and he grabs him by the throat, and he holds him up against the wall. Nathan's a concealed weapons prevail holder. He reaches back behind, and he goes like that, and the big guy saw it, grabbed his wrist, and just held it up in the air, right? Well, he choked Nathan out. So he choked Nathan, Nathan passed out, Nathan falls on the floor, his wife's screaming, he runs out the door and they leave and they go home. Nathan wakes up, takes about 12 minutes, Nathan wakes up and they call the police. And his wife makes a big mistake, not Nathan, his wife did. She took his holster off, took his gun, go puts it in the bedroom, I think it's better if it's she didn't tell the police that. So when the police come over to their house, take their statements, go to arrest the other two kids, which aren't kids, in their mid-twenties, and the subject of the gun came up. So now they go back to his house and they arrest him. We have this governor in Oregon, Brown, <laughs> Flush brown down. That's the motto in our <laughs> Flush brown down. November 6th. Flush her down. Anyway, she's terrible. She's liberal. She's terrible, terrible, terrible person. She's done nothing but raise taxes. And the only reason she's in office at all, at all is she was a Secretary of State and our governor got impeached, so uh, because of his girlfriend. And <laughs> And Brown got put into office, and now this is the first election, and she's just trying to get elected. Oh, not. But anyway, her theory is, I'd like to have all the guns, so any crime that involves a gun in any way, shape, or form, let's punish the hell out of them, okay, whether it's right or wrong. So Nathan gets every charge in the book from it. So I talked to Nathan for about an hour and a half at 11 o'clock at night, and his trial starts at 10 in the morning. I get off the phone at midnight, I call Jamie. I said, Jamie, his wife is not going to let him fire his attorney. She refuses to let him fire his attorney. I've got him talking to it, but she won't do it. So we've got a jurisdictional problem right here, okay? I said, here's what I want you to do. You show up at the courthouse an hour early. I'm going to have Nathan call his attorney first thing in the morning, bright and early, and ask her to show up early, and you're going to have a meeting with her. And I wrote some, some code down telling, telling uh, Jamie what to do with this attorney, how to hold this attorney accountable if she does not do what we tell her to do, because the wife's not going to let us fire her. Okay, so we've got to instruct the attorney to do what she's supposed to do. Now, normally, the prosecutor would present their case. She'd sit on her butt and say nothing and not object, not say here, say not. I, re I we refute that, you know, nothing. Let's just see what happens with the prosecution, and then we get to present our side of the story. 
Oh, wow. Talk about hang anybody. If an attorney ever says that to you, just shoot them. Because <laughs> they're going to put you in jail. You must, at the time, the prosecutor can stand up and lie. He can lie, and he can lie, and he can lie. And if your attorney doesn't object, those lies become the truth. They become fact upon record. And you get hung based upon lies and hearsay. Because did they have any first-hand witnesses? The officer shows up 20 minutes later, an hour later maybe, took a statement. Is he a first-hand witness? He's the only one that stood up on the stand and testified. No first-hand witnesses. No cooperating witnesses. Died, denied some of his evidence. Denied any character witnesses. It's called railroad. Lead down a narrow path of rail to a predetermined outcome or conclusion. That way their conviction rates, and they get rewarded based on conviction rates. So their conviction rates are 97% on the average. Is that even possible? Is there anything? You ever play any sports where you win 97% of the time every time? <laughs> well, they load you up with all kinds of accusations and allegations, and then they make them play out because you're right. taking the death that you're going to serve 30 years. And the, and the plea agreement is basically their stack. Right. They lose some up. Well, the plea agreement is a contract that railroads you into court, into jail. So. It's all contract law. Everything in a courtroom. I mean, I've reviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases, and they almost never have a first-hand witness. No fact or truth shall be told to court. Shall be tried in court. Once in a while, they do have a first-hand witness, but one's not good enough. Got to have two. So almost every case, somebody goes to jail, doesn't belong there. One of the reasons, we do jury trials, not a trial by jury. See, in a jury trial, regardless of what the jury actually says, the judge can overturn it and do other things. But in a trial by jury, the judge can't overrule the jury. So that's the difference. Never ask for a jury trial. Always ask for a trial by jury. Oh, no, wait a minute. It says a jury trial must be of your peers. Look up the legal definition of the word jury of your peers. What does that mean? It means somebody from your own neighborhood who knows your character and your situation in life. What does the prosecutors do if anybody in, coming in for jury duty actually knows who you are? <laughs> Get him out of here. He might like the guy, or he might know that he's an honest man. You see? Now, if they if they know you, you know you're the scum of the neighborhood, that might not be a good thing. Okay, but if you're an average human being, a jury of your peers is going to judge you based on what you did and if there was any background reason for it. Maybe your home just burned down and you lost your wife and dog and your job. <laughs> Sounds like a country song. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> they know that you just went through some circumstances that maybe that's the reason you did what you did. Say what it was, but could have been anything. I could have made about 25 things up there. So, the word previously that is where you come back to those three documents. Because anything you could previously done, if they say they move along and say you have they have tacit agreement of you being a citizen, a person, and a resident, and you can say, Hold on, judge, before we get started, let's. There's a little bit of housekeeping to do. So you can't presume that I'm a citizen or personal resident because I have previously filed this affidavit with the Secretary of State. 
that I've previously recorded my patent and nativity upon the land and my deed of reconveyance. I've done three things to prove that I have the intent not to be a citizen, person, or resident. CPR. I don't need CPR. <laughs> okay? If you need CPR, you're going to jail. So, that is why these are the four most important words in the law to learn. They hold you, like a presumption, citizen, person, or resident, assumption of whatever crime it was they say you did, they're trying it based on hearsay and previously. So let me finish Nathan's story. We told his attorney that we are going to hold her accountable to criminal charges of this, 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 this. I gave Jamie a list of criminal charges that we're going to hold her accountable to if she does not repudiate, refute, rebuke, object to, yell hearsay at the top of her lungs to every word that comes out of a prosecutor's mouth. And Jamie's going to sit in the courtroom and go like this and just watch her. Okay? And Jamie did. She sat in the courtroom and watched her. When the trial was over, she grabbed her little, like, airport suitcase on wheels and she ran out of that building so fast it wasn't even funny. But I'll tell you what, she did what we told her to do. The jury deliberated for less than 10 minutes. Came back out, found him innocent of all charges. The state could not prove their case. David went home free. Now it's hard to force an attorney to do some of that stuff. You got to kind of scare the living daylights out of them <laughs> by knowing what you're talking about. And most of us can't come up with that that quick. And I understand that. Almost nobody can. It's hard. But, you know what Nathan's closing arguments was? I'm innocent, I didn't do it, and, it, and none of her statements were true. He says, yeah. <coughs> that was it. They dismiss the jury. Jury comes back less than 10 minutes, finds medicine. He goes, no. <coughs> so if you can... Speak up, stand upon your own two feet, and yell hearsay, 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 I object, I repudiate that, I repeat that. Go ahead. Did he ever get his weapon back? Yeah, well, we did. He got everything back. But here's the deal you have to have the strength to do that, you got to stand firm. And you have to establish a couple of things that we're going to talk about next. You have to stand upon two rights that you have, that we all have, before you can establish your status, standing, and determine your jurisdiction. What are the two rights? Now, you got some of you know. Went through that class last weekend and just about killed me. <laughs> the foundational cornerstone right every one of us has, and without it, we have no others, is we have the right of self determination. It is known as our foundational cornerstone right. It's up to us to determine our status, standing, and jurisdiction, not anybody else's. It's our beliefs that matter to us. It's how we feel that matters to us. Okay? What's the second one? In this country, we have the right of redress of grievances. And what that means is, when we go to one of our public servants and we bitch and complain about what's happening and what's going on, they're not supposed to hold us accountable to those statements that we make at that time. It's called a peaceful protest. And we have the right to say how we feel. Okay? So that's our second right. If you can stand firmly upon those two rights, then you can go right into status. What is status? 
You're either a citizen or a national of the United States, all defined in U.S. Title VIII, status of a citizen or a national, or you're a state national or a state citizen. What is the difference? If I run for office, if I'm a state national and I decide to run for office as a public servant, may I want to run for sheriff? And I want to run for office, then the minute I take office and swear the oath, then I'm a state citizen. I'm an employee of government, a public servant of government. But when I leave office and I step back into the private world, and I'm a state national. And the same with our federal government. You can be either one. All four are listed in the United States Code Section 8. Okay? What is standing? Have you ever heard the words, all persons are equal in the law. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, young or old. All persons are equal. Why? Because the word person means entity. What's an entity? They're dead. You ever see an animal on the side of the road get up and walk away? I mean, he's dead. So everybody in the courtroom is dead. They're all treated the same. But when a man or a woman walks into the courtroom alive, sue jurists of one's own right, he's the one woman standing. Now you have to establish your standing. That and plus that, plus that, equals that in, on the land. Common law. You just became a commoner. A we the people. A free man. All you got to do, stand upon two rights, establish your status, standing jurisdiction, and you're free. So the Supreme Court is starting to talk about this. What does the Supreme Court say? It says governments chose to incorporate themselves. They must abide by the same rules as any other corporation. The rules, codes, statutes, ordinances, policies, and even executive orders are not law. If you don't believe me, what's the Constitution say? The Constitution, which usurped the Articles of Confederation, what's it say? It says that... Supremacy clause, or hmm? the supremacy clause? Is that what you're looking for? The supremacy clause? Is that what you're asking about? No. So supremacy clause just says federal rights exceed states' rights. Okay. But the Constitution says. I told you this morning. That's not very long ago. I told you a few days ago. Oh, wow. I'm sweating to death. I can't even think of it myself now. Well, what was the this little stunt. What was the question, David? Hmm? What was the question? What did I just say before to the Constitution? Articles of Confederation. I don't know. Repeat it back to me. Not the Articles of Confederation. What did I say before I brought up the Constitution? Statutes aren't law. The rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. The Constitution says only Congress can make laws. Okay, now I have a question for you. Why does every act of Congress since 1861 have a line in it that says, this act shall not affect any rights thus previously established? Because Congress can't pass any ex post facto laws. Our government is de facto when they chose to incorporate themselves. So Congress hasn't passed a law since 1861. They've passed corporate bylaws called statutes. Okay? And then the Supreme Court says that in multiple cases, hundreds of cases. Hale versus Ankles, the most reviewed case in history, happened in 1906 and has been upheld by courts throughout this country 1,600 times or more. In fact, every document that I file has quotes of Hale versus Henkel among hundreds of others. Okay? 
Only Congress can make law. But Congress, in every act of Congress, says, come on, I just told you. This act shall not affect any rights thus previously established. What about legislation? From the... In the state. From the, uh, what do you call it? The, the, the state of Utah or California or Oregon? That's a corporate entity. They haven't passed any laws either. Everything they've passed is ex post facto. The only thing is the state constitution. That's the laws of the state. And any treaties. States that came into the Union after 1861, are they any different than the other states? They could have been. But to, in order for them to get federal money, the federal government's held them at gunpoint just like they've held us at gunpoint. You want federal money, you incorporate and you do things this way. See, our government was created as a bottom-up government. The townships and parishes, the cities, the counties, the states, and then the federal government was only supposed to provide us with 19 essential governmental services, and that's all we agreed to pay for. But it got flipped on its head. And now the federal government controls everything. They control the states, they control the counties, they control the cities, they control the school districts, they control everything. See? Can that be beat with the, uh, I want to call it the supremacy clause, but I'm not sure that's right. Anyway, when we come into, when each state comes in to the union, they are to be held there to. All on the public. equal footing. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So it doesn't matter when they came in. Any state that comes in tomorrow, let's just say they make Puerto Rico a state. It comes on in on the equal footing with Virginia, which was the first state. <clears throat> and Massachusetts, which was the second. So and can, on and on and on and on and on. So it can be beat with that process if we choose to do it. Uh, absolutely right. We can actually create... Start in every county, there's only 3,400 and so, some counties in the entire United States, and create your de jure county government. And there's a process you go through, and it's not hard. You're a, run an ad for 21 days, saying on this date, on this list, which must be, which must be at least 30 days away, 30 days away, we're going to hold a meeting and we're going to have a discussion. And we're going to see if any of you guys want to do this. It's a public meeting, invite everybody, invite the county commissioners and the police department, sheriff, and invite everybody in the county through an ad that you ran for 21 days in the public that you're going to hold a meeting. You're just going to have a discussion. It's open to anybody. And you're going to hold a discussion and talk about de facto versus de jure government. What would you guys like to see? You live here. All of you. You live here. What would you like to see? I don't live here. You guys do. <coughs> That's right. Most people, when they understand the fraud, of what has taken place, they're all going to say, I want to do your government. So, when that meeting is over, another 30 days away, you say, we're going to hold elections. Start thinking about what position in our county government you'd like to have. The undertaker, the water master, the garbage collector, the court clerk, the county judge, the sheriff, you, you, you guys, you guys who figured out what job you think you'd be good at. And now maybe five people want that job. So you hold elections. But you have to publish it in the paper for 21 days 
of the 30, you got a big publish to do that we're going to be holding elections. So you hold elections. You, this was the legal process, okay? You hold elections. You're the sheriff, and you're the undertaker, and you're the garbage collector, or whatever, the water master, all these positions that are in county. Most counties, it takes about 75 people. How many do they have down there in the county? Mm -hmm. Way more than that. But they sit around on there and don't work. You guys are actually going to work because you want it. Okay? Now, the general public, the rest of the people that don't want that job, they've got other jobs. They don't want it. You go to them and say, all right, you're the water master. Your regular water bill is fifty dollars a month. If we do this right, we're going to be able to lower it to say twenty-five down the road. Because you can run it more efficiently than government every time, I guarantee. You. So now you have to give them a ninety-day notice. So you send a notice you, in the paper ninety days prior. For 21 days, you run an ad in the newspaper, all government officials in Cache County, Utah, that were not elected in our meeting that was held on such and such a date for the position, and you currently hold a position, on Friday at 4 o'clock, the Friday after this period's up, police have all your personal items boxed up and your keys prepared. Because there will be somebody there to meet you as you walk out of the building. This is exactly what Iceland and Bulgaria and several other countries have done. And you show up, 3 o'clock, he went outside the building, and he walks out with his box and his keys, and you put your hand out. And he takes his box and his car, and on Monday morning, you got a new job. Now, all the water bills that are currently coming in, it just continues to pay this, the salaries. What you do is you just collapse the corporation, and you have the unincorporated city. There's lots of unincorporated cities in the United States. Well, Pine, Oregon, just south of Bend, is an unincorporated city. Many, many unincorporated cities. There's a few unincorporated counties in the United States already. Anna J. Brown, the judge on Shawna Cox's trial in Portland, she owns 3,000 acres in an unincorporated county in Montana. There's another one in Kentucky. So there's a couple unincorporated counties. It works. It's been working for hundreds of years. Why do they need to incorporate? Because then they can sell the corporations, and one guy can own five county courthouses. And he bases his office in Ogden, Utah. And he owns Cash County Courthouse. And it's got a Dun & Bradstreet number. Do your research. When I go into a courtroom, so instead of, don't we, instead of we people in the courthouse, they own and charge us rent. Is that how that kind of works? They steal it out of your SESTA QV to pay for it. Okay? When you go into a courthouse, you walk in there with the state, it's Dun & Bradstreet number, and you say a de facto state government instead of Utah on the land. And you say the county of Cash instead of Cash County. Dun & Bradstreet number, blah, blah, blah. And the first district court of Cash County with its Dun & Bradstreet number, a privately held for-profit court. And you can look up the prosecutor's office and you get the name of his company that he really works out of and show that his Dun & Bradstreet number. And you begin to expose the fraud of the whole thing. And see? It goes back to, would they all be listed in Dun & Bradstreet? Is that kind of a, you know? Every corporation in the world is listed. Yeah. The United States government, I've got their Dun & Bradstreet number. I've got every agency's Dun & Bradstreet number. Wow. How many people believe, for this one again this morning, how many people believe the FBI has any authority? <laughs> huh? Huh? Federal Bureau of Investigations, you know, I'll know the one. David, can we have a break just for five okay. or six minutes yes. right here and then we'll come back? I'll give you a chance to look it up and swallow more water.
Mr. Lawrence Robertson wrote to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. and essentially an FOIA request asking for information on the FBI. He wanted a copy of the federal charter. Okay? And the Library of Congress wrote back to him. And a funny little side note, it says, Law Library, American British Law Division. Mm. Okay? It says, Dear Mr. Robertson, this is in response to your request for a copy of the charter of the Fourth World Bureau of Investigation. Can't hurt them. Our research shows that while most entities within the federal government are officially established by Congress and defined by charter, the Federal Bureau of Investigation is not. And the date you mentioned in your letter identifies a proposal made in front of Congress that a formal charter be adopted. The charter, however, was not approved. It was denied. So the FBI actually went to Congress and said, can we have the authority to do what we're doing? And Congress said, nope. So what gives them the authority to do what they do? The consent of the government. They come up to me and said, hey, I need some information from you. I think you did this, 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 and this. And I said, you don't have my consent. I'm not going to give them tacit agreement. I said, there's not going to be any presumptions or assumptions. No hearsay. No waiver of my rights. We will not have a contract and there will be no tacit agreements. Sorry. And from now on, I plead with them. And you just show up. And they can't do anything to you. I got a friend of mine who was arrested. Cops put the cuffs on him. They put him in his cop car. And he zipped his lips. And he got to the police station. And he was put in an interrogation room. They started asking him all kinds of questions. And he just smiled at him. And he zipped his lips. He didn't even say his name. He didn't say nothing. And they took him in front of the judge in a hearing. The judge asked him all kinds of questions. And he zipped his lips. Just dismiss the case and he goes home. Because he didn't incriminate himself, he didn't open his mouth, he didn't give him any tacit agreement, he didn't give him any agreement of any kind. And he went home. I don't give my consent, it's probably one of the most important things first that one can do. Here's another trick. Let me tell you one of the biggies. There's a new law that was passed, Tim McGregor tried that in, in Roy, and he, they said you, well, he was, yeah, someone accused him of something in Riverdale, driving by and not stopping for pedestrians. Anyways, went to court and he pled the fifth, and they charged him with failure to identify, it's a new law. Yeah, and, you gotta identify yourself, yeah, it's how you identify one, yourself in that. $300, $300. It's how you identify yourself. It's what documentation you use or what you say. If I would have said, if I was him, he said I would have said. It wasn't there. He used to teach law as a sheriff. I understand that. But if he would have said, my name is David, capital letter D, A, B, I, D, lowercase, L, capital letter, L, E, S, T, E, R. I'm from the genealogy of the straight family. I have been dead in myself just fine according to law and can't do a damn thing to me. So it's all in how you do it. But you do have to identify yourself. That's why you have to carry a passport. You can't just say like some of these idiots on Facebook, on YouTube. <laughs> Look right at you. I don't care. I know you. I wouldn't do it if I, I didn't know you very well. 
but you just refuse to give them your driver's license and stuff and say, I don't need a driver's license to go down the highway and they're going to ticket you anyway because you didn't provide the proper documentation. What does the Constitution say? We must be safe in our persons. But, but back then, the per word person meant something different. It was the Reconstruction Act that re redefined the word person. Safe in your persons, papers, and effects, right? You must have your papers on you. It's always been that way. It's been that way since King John. Don't you have to establish probable cause to ask for your identification? It's so bad now that these police officers don't even know that. When, when, they were, when I, if I rode down that way, though, I just used to hold roadblocks here in Utah. Mm -hmm. Just out of random. It's sure. roadblocks on the freeway. And I was coming from Arizona, and I pulled up, and I scanned, I rolled down the window, and I said, what's your probable cause for stopping me for traffic? And the deputy didn't know what to say. He yelled at somebody else, and he told them, and he sent us through. Right. But I, I asked them that, and they didn't establish it, so they couldn't stop them. Right. All you did was throw up a challenge. And that's what we're supposed to do to hold them accountable. It was our duty to govern. Government lives within each and every one of you. The de jure government is alive and well. It's in each of your hearts. But as Judge Napoleono says, it can't just lie there. Okay? So you have to stand upon your rights, two of them, establish your status, standing jurisdiction, and then you can stand upon your other rights. So I want to talk about one thing really quick. We need to know what our rights are, where they came from, where they're written down. They're written down in lots and lots of documents. How many of people can tell me what some of their unalienable rights are? Probably all of them. Okay. You heard me. There's a bunch of our rights written down in the Holy Bible. The Magna Carta lists a lot of our rights. Our constitutions, our conventions, our Bill of Rights, our all three Geneva Conventions, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But I want to talk about one of the most recent. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Let's talk about that document for a minute. That was written by just a just an everyday guy in the 1950s. And in 1966, it was taken in front of the Hague at the United Nations, and it was talked about. And they went through this actually really early in 66. I think it was January. Six months later, the United Nations had another meeting, and they adopted it. In 1966. But they weren't going to put it into effect until March 22nd, 1976, giving the countries that signed on to the treaty 10 years to put it into their teachings at their schools and into their laws and into their constitutions and things like that. As of today, 174 countries have signed that treaty. 174 nations have signed that treaty. Russia signed it in 1992, and in 1992 they signed that treaty, and they used that treaty to build a new constitution, and Russia became a democracy, and President Putin was elected into office, and he's so beloved by his people that they re-elected him over and over and over again, and Russia became a freer country that day than the United States of America is today. They're, they have been a communist country since 1993. What keeps them a communist country in our minds? The media. Okay? Uh, Boris Johnson was the first president after that. Oh, shut up. He was for a little bit. We're <laughs> <laughs> just going to go past him. <laughs> he drank himself to death. Yeah, he did. He drank himself to death. He died. Putin was elected. All right, lots of countries have signed on to that. When did the United States sign on to it? In 1966? No. In 1976? In 1992 when Russia did? They signed in 1993 because Russia did. 
You can't let Russia do something we didn't do. So they signed it in 1993. What was the name of it again? What was it called, David? The ICCPR, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. Okay? The United States signed it in 1993, but they signed it with a condition. They were one of the only countries that signed it with conditions. And the condition was that Articles 1 through 27 shall not be self-executing. Well, it just happens that Articles 1 through 27 is the list of rights, the Bill of Rights in that document. And the United States says, no, it's not going to be. They shall not be self-executing. What does that mean in the law? It means they're not going to tell us about it. They're not going to put it in our schools. They're not going to put it in our laws. They're not going to bring it up on, in courts on our behalf. Okay? But what does it say later on in that document? It says that all states, state parties to the covenant, at every level of government, right down to every municipality, every judge, every officer, every agent, every agency, must obey it if it's brought into the light. So if we learn about it, and some idiot from Oregon teaches you about it, and you bring it up on your own behalf, and article number one is the cornerstone right, the right of self-determination, and later down in the articles, one of the major rights that I deal with every day, because I work a lot of child protective services cases, is no one has a greater right to their child than the parent. And there's lots of other rights listed in there. Okay? And if we bring it up, we bring it to sunlight, every judge, every officer, every police officer must obey it. And what happens if they don't? All we got to do is pick up the phone. It says right at the end of the, the document, pick up the phone, call the Secretary of State of the United Nations. And he's going to call the Secretary of the United Nations Human Rights Center in Switzerland. In Geneva. And he's going to call the Secretary of State of the United States. And the Secretary of State is going to call the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice is going to call your judge. And holy crap, it's crap going to roll downhill. Because he's going to jail. He just broke a tree. And trees are known as what? Supreme law. They override everything but our Constitution. See, God's laws are called superior law. God and natural laws are superior law. Constitutions of our country and our states, and any treaty thereof is supreme law. What are our rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances, and executive orders, and policies? Well, not a law at all. <laughs> Everything else is down here on the ground. Corporate rules and procedure. That's right, they're corporate bylaws, and the Supreme Court says that in multiple cases. They're only for employees of that corporation to fall. You're saying the UN has actually done some good? The UN has done a lot of good on the civil rights side. Now, on the other side of the coin, they get like $1.3 trillion a year in their budget. And their mission statement says they're supposed to lend that money back out, except for a small administration fee, to countries that are in need, people that are in need. And I haven't looked it up recently, but about three years ago I looked it up, it was 1.3 trillion, and they lent out 200 million. So 1.1 trillion of their money went into the coffers of the United Nations, and they generously lent 200 million now to poor underdeveloped countries, even though that's their mission statement. Just think, you triggered me to thinking here something. One of the things our county done, has done is they, they snuck in some fees on there that says franchisee fees. Well, the franchisee fees, they're, they're, all they're doing is slipping us into the corporation as an employee. You're an employee anyway. I mean, you're not really. I question that. But they're holding you as after a presumption. Right. Okay. Yeah. But like you, you said. Get, you get no explanation whatsoever. I mean, they can't explain it. But that's, you're in, 
you have to pay that franchisee. So, so let's talk about one thing that affects most of us. Both, anybody homeowners? Well, you think you are. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> All properties vested in the state. You don't own a darn thing because you pay property taxes on it, right? That's your rent. See, I'll tell you what happens. Let's just sit, I'll, I'll give you several examples. I used to own 20% of the title company. Okay? Young married couple. I'm going to pick on you two because you look so cute together. <laughs> Young married couple goes to buy their first home and they go get a mortgage and they go to their title company to close and they're sitting there looking at all their mortgage documents starting to get into sweat and fear because they know they're going to have payments for another 30 years and the title officer looks at them and says, how would you like to hold titles? Well, we didn't learn that in kindergarten through 12th grade. <laughs> We have a bachelor's degree. We didn't want it there either. What are our options, right? What are our options? The title officer, they're in this theft process too. So they look right at them and say, well, most married couples, husband and wife, hold title and joint tenants in common. So let's analyze that for a minute. Joint, husband and wife, right? First, they have a contract with the state. They got married. Oh, so big mistake, the way they did it. If you look in the United States Patent and Trademark Office, under the blueprint for a patent on a marriage, here is the state. Here is the animal husbandry. Here is the wife. And here the word God. The state is the primary. The state marries the husband. The state marries the wife. Solid line. Anybody that knows blueprints, any engineers besides me in the room? I've got a degree in engineering, too. What does a dotted line mean? It means a beam that bears no weight. They just took God out of the picture. You guys thought you did your vows and you got married to God. And our church went along with this ever since 1905. A lot of things happened in 1905 in our church. Find out who the prophet was. Anyway, God bears no weight. This is a patented blueprint with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Go look it up. I've done my research. I don't need to look it up again. Now, what is another legal, lawful way to get married? Huh? <laughs> go, go, buy a, go buy a holy Bible. A family Bible. with extra blank pages, and you record your marriage, witnesses who officiated, the address, the time, date, place it was held, and you record in the Bible, and you record your children's births, and your deaths in your family, and everything else, and you take a picture of that, and it'll say Holy Bible at the top of every page, and you don't really have to take one of the front cover, but I do anyway. And then you, Make up a little affidavit, and you go down to your county recorder's office, and you go record the picture every time there's a new event. Now your son Chris is born, say, on such and such a date, and you record it again. And then somebody died on this day, and you just record your family events. That's the way it was done for a thousand years or more. Two thousand years almost. That's what's called common law. Isn't it? it is common law. Form. It is common law. Yeah. yeah. It's taking this away from the state. What happens when this person and this person gets a divorce? 
state makes money. The contract didn't end. You know, you're, anybody who's been married more than once, you're still married to your first wife. The contract still exists. The only way this goes away is an annulment. And do you think they're going to give you an annulment five, six, seven, eight years down the road? Yep, she got the house and everything you had. Well, that's just equity. That's not an annulment. Some women, it's better off if you just write them a check and buy them the house first and get it over with. Okay? Hard for dicks. And that, women say that about men, too, so she looked at me really sly in there for a minute. Well, there's so much to say. Now I forgot what I was going to say. But Hartford Van Dyke um, says, you know, the way you can get out of that is since the state did not give full disclosure to what they did. That's the only way you can do it is prove the fraud. See, that was one of my next things. How do we get people out of prison that's been there for 10 years, convicted? Maybe they're serving 10, they've served 10 years of a 20 year sentence. Maybe they served all 20 years and 20 years later they want it wiped off their record. How do you, how do you get it wiped off? Prove the fraud. Show the fraud. You challenge jurisdiction? And you prove the fraud. Two things that have no statute of limitations, and they vitiate everything ab initio from the beginning. They void everything from the beginning. So if I can walk into a court of law on somebody like your husband or Marion's son or Gina, <clears throat> and we can prove jurisdiction challenge jurisdiction and prove it and we can prove the fraud of this whole ball of wax that I've been telling you right here tonight governments are incorporated cells that don't even have real money I mean show the whole fraud lay it all out lay out the fraud of the bar association we signed a treaty with the bar in 1947 British accreditation registry think they're Americans they're required to register with the Foreign Agents Registration Act do they very seldom very few of them. Just that alone can throw the case out. I put that in the document, by the way. Okay? Jurisdiction of fraud, no statute of limitations, voids everything. Ab initio, from the beginning. Let me ask you a question. Does Cash County Courthouse, any of the judges or prosecutors down there, want what I'm being taught in this room right here being taught? <laughs> or do they want me to put it in documents so some little law student at Cornell University can look up the county record and find it? No. So the best thing they do for us when I submit these documents is they throw the hammer down, dismiss the case, and wipe it off the face of the earth so nobody can find it. Because then some little Harvard law student can't go, oh, 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 I can win every case in the country with this. I'm going to be the greatest lawyer in the world. <laughs> you won't show case law for that. Right? Huh? You won't show any case law? For the cases that get dismissed? Yes, nah, pretty much wipes them out. I... I could, if we were sitting in my office at home right now, I've got stacks of cases that I've worked on over the years, right? And I could go in there and I'd say, all right, this was in this county, here's the case number, here's everything. Call the county and see if they got the case number. Oh, they can't find it. Well, darn it, they can't find it anywhere. Doesn't exist. Jamie Kobat's case. Can't find it. Well, wait a minute. We were. <laughs> I got the indictment right here. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got all the documentation. But the best way for them to hide it from the rest of you, commoners like me, is to void it from the beginning, like it never happened, and just hit the delete key. 
and it's gone. And then you go home and you're happy and you're free. That's okay. It's not a bad thing. See, and then we can go after them for the emoluments clause of the Constitution and we can impeach the judge and we can take the prosecutor's house and the retirement fund. If we won't really want to be nasty. Sometimes it's kind of fun. Have you recently read any articles that the uh, West Virginia Supreme Court, every single one of them, went to jail? How about the Pennsylvania oh, yeah. Supreme Court? Every single one of them went to jail this year. Mm -hmm. You want me to start naming judges all over the country? Yeah. <laughs> Prosecutors all over the country? We're having so much. Is there a David Wynn? Uh, David Wynn Miller's dead. Is he dead? Yeah. I went to his funeral in June. Okay, I've seen in Reno. An hour and a half video of his before you were. Absolutely. Parse syntax grammar. It's perfect language. If you open the Bible and you know what parse syntax grammar even is, because they didn't teach you that in grade school, I guarantee it. You can pick out Jesus' words like they're jumping off the page if you know parse syntax grammar. Because all of his words were what? Perfect. Now there's a few little instances in there where somebody mistranslated them and those don't jump off the page too well. But what is the English language? It's verb, adverb, verb. Sentence structure. R.C. syntax grammar is perfect language. It's all got all is a mathematical equation. So David Wynn Miller had a 200 plus IQ, was living in Hawaii, and he was a English major, taught at the University of Hawaii. And he gets on an airplane to go give a speech somewhere, and because of the weather and such, he ends up somewhere else. And he's sitting in a coffee shop in an airport where he's not even supposed to be. And Jay Gould, who has a 200 plus IQ, and is a unbelievable mathematician who was going somewhere else to put on a seminar and ended up in the same city in the same coffee shop at the same time with David Wynn Miller and they started talking and they go back David says hey you live in the in the uh, upper Midwest it's colder than heck up there this time of the year that's why we're in this airport instead of the one we're supposed to be and he says, why don't you come to my house in Hawaii? And we'll talk about this. And they went to his house in Hawaii. And they set up a company. And hired a bunch of people. And they put math to work, language. Figured it out. They used the Bible. And then they went to the Hawaiians. And they, which we stole Hawaii from the Hawaiians, by the way. There's a great YouTube video, little gal in a skirt, Hawaiian little lady thing, and she's acting like she's a travel agent, come to Hawaii, but she's telling the whole story of the theft of Hawaii. It's the cutest video ever. I watch it every once in a while, just for fun. <laughs> but he took the Hawaiians and he set up an entire nation of a few hundred acres on the island using parse syntax grammar and won it from them in court. For them in court. Well, just a little while ago, there was a Hawaii Five O episode where somebody in Honolulu committed a murder or something, and they chased him up there. He went up there to escape their jurisdiction. And the cops got to the gate, and they, they're stopped. They can't do anything. And the Hawaiian on the other side of the gate is going, now you know I can't let you boys in here. And no jurisdiction whatsoever. Okay? David Wynn Miller actually caused our housing crisis. And I lost nine million bucks, personally. Almost everything I'd worked for for 35 years. And I still love the man because he did what was right. See? But he went in front of Congress and he proved every mortgage in the country through Parsi Syntax Grammar was fraud and void. From the beginning. And the Bank of America had a representative in the back of the room, and they ran out and fire sale 
all their mortgages the countrywide owned to Wells Fargo, Chase Manhattan, <laughs> and they fire sell it because they knew they were too big to fail and the government would bail them out anyway. So they sold them all at the same discount, created the mortgage crisis, and we all lost money. I mean, most of us. Okay? And that's what happened. Dave William Miller stood in front of Congress and did that. Jay Gould is the, is the postmaster general of the world. That's why the U.S. Postal Service headquarters is in Bern, Switzerland. Because he went in front of the Hague, they testified in front of the Hague, and Dave Wood Miller and Jay Gould made millions of dollars because they proved the language in front of the Hague, and small little countries all over the globe started saying, we need to rewrite our constitutions. And they wrote him in Parsi Syntax Grammar and paid him millions to write, rewrite their constitutions. But he testified in front of the Hague and he proved it. He testified in front of Congress and he proved Parsi syntax grammar. He testified it in front of the UPN. And, and Jay Gold says, watch this. He says, here's my contract. You guys signed it. He mailed himself. He mailed himself in a box from the United States to Bern, Switzerland. And he proved the contract, and he became Postmaster General of the world. And that's his official position there, still. But that's what perfect language does. America, all of our contracts, if you want to prove them in parsley syntax grammar, you'll see that almost every contract is null and void. Now the problem is the courts understand that now. After Dave Wynn Miller won in courts everywhere, all over the place, the court started rewriting their own rules of civil procedure and their local rules in the federal courthouses and their rules of criminal procedure. They started rewriting everything we do and we discover once they figure out that we're affecting their pocketbook, they change the rules. So, anyway. Are we close to quitting time? What's our time? Can you write that on the board there? The one more syntax the language? Okay. Terminology. Right. Part of the it. You want to know how to spell it? In my document that I've used in court, there's one whole section written in Parsi syntax grammar. Where does the Parsi syntax come from? Why those words? Are they, are they Latin? Okay, now you're asking me things I don't know. I am not perfect. I am fallible. I am a man. But. Oh, she said they're Latin, so they're Latin words. It may, must probably mean perfect Latin. Any, any English majors in the room? You know? You're good at it, I know. So, no, I don't know. I don't care. See, I, my thing is, I only have this much space in here, right? This big of a hard drive, and it's, I filled it up pretty much. So I can't remember all your names. It won't fit in there. I'd rather remember what's in really important. It'll save a lot of people. You need to tell them a little about uh, Russia and about your little... He, he oh. grows some of the best feed in the world. With, I mean... I don't need to tell them about that. That's a whole other thing. No, it's, it's, it's... I don't brag about myself. I won't tell them how smart I am. <laughs> and well, and that, Jim is the one that brought it up. Not that's me. big time. That's big time. Well, I know, but... Tell them, about, tell them about the Ukraine, though, or that area. I have a few patents on stuff. Oh, you want me to tell them about Chern Chernobyl? Chernobyl, or? yeah. You need See, then I'm just bulging secrets I'm not really supposed to tell, especially in big groups. The federal agents in the room. <laughs> See, here's the thing. If you have not been where I've been, 
you can talk about a lot of stuff that I can't talk about. And I'm going to tell you that right now. There are things I can't talk about because if I talk about them, I'm committing treason. So I'm not going to talk about anything I can't talk about, but there's a few things I can't talk about. See, I'm a member of the National Association of Retired Intelligence Officers. I don't want to tell you all that. But it comes from military first, and then an honorary gift. Because of technology, the Central Intelligence Agency said I had invented some incredible technology. And let me tell you something about the CIA, because most of us hate the CIA, right? But let me tell you something. There's a 45 foot concrete wall, 45 feet thick, and you have the operatives over here. And you have what I call geniuses. Because every, I don't know how to how are you spell genius? <laughs> I'm going to go, hey, you, I'm tired. I really am exhausted. So, even on my good days, I'm better than most people. On my bad days, I'm better than most people. As far as lawyers and judges especially. I can kick their butts on my worst day. <laughs> These guys are geniuses. The Central Intelligence Agency has a knack for recruiting the best of the best of the best. The very best electronics expert in the United States, my friend Shields Fair. Shields is 80 years old now. He calls me almost every day. It's like a dad to me. When Shields was 12 years old, he was tearing apart soldering and building radio systems. And he loved it so much that he lied about his age when he joined the military. And he, in a 20-year career in the military, he, he revamped the entire naval communication systems, while allowing the Navy to listen to the stuff that they never even could think about listening to before. And then, he, after 20 years in the military, he got out, and he became an executive for Motorola. And all of a sudden, Motorola's, everybody's phone, car phones used to be in a box, right? Big old hunky things. And all of a sudden, Motorola came out with little phones, right? Shield spare. And they, he was an executive for Motorola, and he grew so big in the company that they, he was open to work. Uh, factories in Mexico and all kinds of stuff. Well, he also did something else. The CIA recruited him. And he was building listening devices that were about that big. <coughs> and for 10 years, he placed them all over Russia, even inside the Kremlin. He did all kinds of neat little things like that all over the world. But he was an expert at listening devices. And I watched him open a briefcase one time. And there's like 85 listening devices in here that he had designed and developed and built. Then I have another friend, his name's Dr. Lawrence Royce. Dr. Lawrence Royce was the number one leading bioscientist in the United States. And he was working at the University of Louisville in Kentucky when Chernobyl happened. And the CIA came in and said, hey, we need you to go run all the doctors and scientists over in Russia. That you know. And the reason why is the Chernobyl was here and the mushroom cloud was 50 miles wide and 150 miles long. They were little villages. And people were getting sick and they were dying and stuff. These little villages all over this area, little towns. And there was this one town that they called the Blue Area. And nobody was getting sick. Men, women, children, nobody was getting sick. So the first thing they did is they took over an elementary school. And all elementary schools in the world are pretty much the same. There are three walls and a wall of glass in the hallway. And he's standing in this little laboratory they created in the school room. And every day for weeks, he looked across this big giant field. And he says, he stared at the largest grain elevators he'd ever saw in his life. 
He had lived all over the Midwest, seen some pretty big grain elevators, and these were even larger. Well, come to find out, once he made friends with some of the locals and he started talking and figuring out why these people aren't getting sick, their immune system tests were off the charts. And he found out that that town was a chemical weapons biological manufacturing plant. And the federal government of Russia was giving them handfuls of pills to take. And they'd take a handful of pills every morning. And these grain elevators that he saw out of that schoolroom window were filled with chemicals that had killed the world over 10,000 times. One of them would be full of anthrax. And one of them would be filled with something else. So he calls the CIA buddies. They send a team of operatives in. They drill a hole on the side of these grain elevators, and they fill it full of thermoplasmite. And these things just melt to the ground. And they kill all those bad diseases and bad things in there. So Dr. Lawrence Royce, I'm sure they were all done over there, he brought back some of the world's finest Russian and Ukrainian scientists, and they got funding, and he bought a college campus in Boulder, Colorado, and he started the world's only all-natural nonprofit pharmaceutical company because they analyzed what was in those pills. And if your body has the proper pH all the way from the saliva into the stomach through the large and small intestine, there's different pH levels in your body. And inside those different pH levels live different types of bacteria. And that bacteria digests your food. Lactobacillus salivarius will cure gum disease and make your teeth last longer. And no, you don't need fluoride to do that. All you need is to open a couple of lactobacillus salivarius and put it on a teaspoon and put it on your tongue. Let it sit there for a while, roll it around, let some saliva gather, and then about 10 minutes later, wash it down with a little bit of water. And it'll cure your mouth. Well, there's other bacteria that will cure your entire gut. And 98% of all disease starts from it because you have an unhealthy gut. My mother, she used to use soap on my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with a mother. I was the baby. Okay. So anyway, what they discovered in Russia is all these tablets what was in them, and where it came from, and how did we get them. And the funny thing is, the state of North Carolina grows about 2,000 varieties of Venus flytrap. And these different bacteria live in different varieties of Venus flytraps that have different pH levels. And a bug gets in there, like a fly or any other kind of bug, and it digests it so well that absorbs all the nutrients of the entire bug into the plant. The plant grows nice and healthy. And those bacteria live in different parts of our body from different types of varieties of plants in the right pH level. So he has this little concoction you make up in a mason jar and you let it sit for about two weeks and all the solids sink to the bottom and it pickles itself. And then you take and you start with like a tablespoon. And it, at first, really bad, but I learned to like it so much. And then all the solids you can just cook with. It makes great steak marinade and all this kind of stuff. And that concoction for about three weeks cleans your entire system, all the mucus out of your intestines. This is uh, getting gross, I'm sorry. But <laughs> then, those bacteria live there healthy, and everything we eat gets pretty much fully digested. Okay? And our body absorbs it much better. We get much more of the nutrients that we need that normally passes right through our system because our gut's in it healthy. Our pH level changes in our body, so when you uh, 
I, I suggest buy paper pH tests, like you could test your swimming pool water or your spa water with. You can buy like 300 of them at Walmart for six bucks or Walgreens for six bucks. And every day, put one on your tongue and pee on one and look at it. And while you're doing the system, I'm serious, every day. And while you're doing the system, you'll watch your pH get more alkaline. Cancer can't live in an alkaline environment, guys. At all. He has found that they can cure 98% of all cancers just by changing the pH of your body and improving your digestive system with probiotics. But they, not these probiotics you get, not yogurt. I mean, that only helps about one little tiny few inches in your system, and it's 20 plus feet long at different pH factors. But Dr. Lawrence Royce, genius. And the CIA tends to do that. So, is that covered? <laughs> Yeah, where can you where can you buy some of that? Do you, do you have a source of where to get it? Well, this company, you can go on Amazon, look up two products. And then he says he will not produce Lactobacillus salivarius, salivarius, because it's too cheap and he can't make a profit and he can't fund his business that way. Because you can buy a couple bottles of that for like $7 on Amazon. Hundreds of companies make it, they've been making it for years. This one's always been common. These two are unbelievable in what they do. Now here's the key. You must shock your system every day. So you want to average three to five of these a day, depending on your stage in life. The older you get, you should have more. And this, you want to get two to average two to three a day. So one day you take one, one day you take seven, the next day you take two, the next day you take six, and you just keep shocking your system. Because if you don't, it's not as effective. You, you need to shock it, and then your immune system reacts. So you just keep shocking your system by varying the number of tablets you take. How does that help your health? I'm just up here. I don't get any commission from selling this product. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of that. Now I know how I had to fund my trips around here to talk to you guys. <laughs> now I got to talk to Larry. Well, you're anti-cancer. We love that. We, we, we'll have to get pink ribbons now. <laughs> <laughs> tell a flight here to tell you about uh, soda and, uh, and syrup. Oh, you know, you know they, they use baking soda on YouTube and somebody do that. But some of these enzymes are probably, they probably do a better job just because they're more efficient. Than well, pretty, pretty much these guys were handling things like anthrax and their bodies were immune to it. Yeah. Okay, I'll go with that. What does, what does it cost you, what's it cost you uh, say, a month to, to use these? You can buy two bottles of this for about $70. That's about a two-month supply for one person. Oh. So about 35 bucks a month. This one's a little, I don't know offhand. My wife buys it, you know, I don't get to spend any money. It's probably about $35. And uh, this is like $7 a bottle. And that'll last you. So, so a couple dollars a day. I'll tell you why. It's cheaper than any prescription the doctor's going to give you. <laughs> See, well, don't do a doctor. Now, one other thing you need to show, you need to show some pictures from this owner of what you've done with this guy, feed the animals. It's incredible. He's got greenhouse stuff there. That they're, plus, your, plus your gold, uh, your gold chips. No, <laughs> don't even get into this stuff. <laughs> Steve. Uh, David, would you tell us what it's like to uh, be in the position that you are and being a free man? Oh, the free man part of it's really good. I mean, I don't worry about stuff anymore. I mean, cop puts on his lights behind me, he walks up to his window, I say, 
Is everything okay? You created an emergency where none existed. <laughs> How can I help? I've got my sidearm right here. I can help you. I'll back you up, buddy. I'm trained. Okay. Or you can just shake his hand, smile. How you doing? He says you got your driver's license, your passport, your registration, and you say, "Well, of course I do." He goes, "Can you have it?" No, because I don't want to hand it to you when I'm in commerce, right? I'm not going to give you the long version. When I'm in commerce, I said, "But here's my passport. It says right here, your job is to look at my picture, make sure I'm not giving you somebody else's." and say, you're free to go along your way. I won't detain you any longer. Have a nice day. <laughs> and you go on. And they don't bother you. Well, you do that two or three or four times, like in the county you live in. I drive through Deschutes County. I don't wear my seatbelt half the time. I don't put on my turn signal. And it's not that I'm being unsafe, but if there's cars around, I'm going to do it. I love my neighbor and do no harm. I don't want to hurt anybody, so I try and be as safe as I possibly can. I'm not in it to injure myself or others. But if there isn't a car in sight, and I want to make a corner, am I going to put my turn signal on? No, I'm going to go around the corner. If he's sitting behind a 7-Eleven, and he pulls me over to stop me, hey, officer, did you create an emergency where none existed? That's a felony, you know, I know this stuff. My Deschutes County Sheriff's hat right there in my window and my coffee cup that says, I am your worst nightmare. <laughs> it's sitting on my dash, because I put, I, that's my court cup. I have to take it to court with coffee in it and point it at the prosecutor and the judge. <laughs> but as long as you're nice, you're friendly, and you stand upon your rights as a belligerent claimant, that's what the law requires, by the way. And you stand upon your rights firmly. See, I tell everybody that I'm coaching to when they go to court, stand with their feet, shoulders width apart, one slightly forward and lean on it. And then when you're talking to the judge and you're dressed like one today, just need the rope. <laughs> and you're talking to the judge, you look him right in the eye and you talk to him as your public servant, but nice. Be nice. We might go golfing later. Okay? No, you won't. But maybe. Okay. <laughs> but when you're talking to the prosecutor, you don't move your feet. You're going to take a firm stand and you're going to talk to your prosecutor. And I like to use my hands to talk. When I tell him off, and I don't care what he thinks, when I tell him off, I'm going to tell him to him with a smile on my face. Because have you ever seen a bunch of mug shots? Yeah. A book of mug shots? What do people look like? Okay, it's the worst picture that's ever been taken of them in their entire life. But the one guy who's smiling, that's the guy that knows he's going to be out within 24 hours. Not a damn thing I can do about it. See, that's the difference. It's just be nice, be friendly. They're your neighbors. He might live down the street from you. You love thy neighbor and you do no harm. So treat people with respect. When I say be belligerent, belligerent does not mean rude. It is a fighting cause. It is sustained combat. It is in the room. It's back and forth. It's, it, it's a debate. And it's a, the burden of proof's on you, buddy. Where's your first-hand witnesses? Where's your evidence? I'm giving this no fact or truth. She'll be trying court because I've already told you presumptions, assumptions, hearsay, Ruling from the bench, no tacit agreements, nothing. Where is it? Now we're only trying it on fact and truth, and that's all I'm asking for is fair justice. You guys killed Lady Justice off, by the way. Strangled her and held her under water and killed her. Not bring her back to life. See? Take, her. Take the CPR. Okay. Uh, so, how much of that language can you use to stay off of a jury? Why would you want to stay off of a jury? Or to be on a jury? Every chance I get, I want to be on a jury. God, I pray for. That's the one thing I go to the mailbox for, is a jury notice. <laughs>
That's how you change law in this country. You don't just judge the trial, but you judge the law. And even if a man is guilty, if the law is bad, you acquit and deny that law's existence. See? It is better to let, let one guilty man go free than to convict a thousand innocents on a bad law. And what's happening in America today? 1.2 million statutes, rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. Supreme Court of our United States says so. Okay, what else? Any questions? Right. Want to talk about something else that affects everybody's life, like land patents? So about 13 minutes. Yeah. Okay, in 13 minutes I can explain how the county steals your property. Okay? Get your tax statements out, your property tax statements out, and go down and correct the errors. And it's filled with them. It's got your name in all caps. It's got your address on it without any care of it. It's got your zip code. Heck, isn't it your property? Can't you name it any dang thing you want? See, I live at 61037 Groff Road, according to the post office. But on my house, it says 61037 Boxer Boulevard, because I raise boxer dogs. I name my own damn street. It goes right in my property. See? Because I took my property back. See, the United States Code says all properties in this country shall be in meets and bounds. What does the county do? They send some idiot out and he re describes your property as Lot 27 and Block 3 of Whitewater Subdivision. And he just stole your property from you for the state, on behalf of the state. All property in the United States shall be in meets and bounds. You find the section that your property's in, you go down to the Bureau of Land Management's office and you request the original land patent. You go to your title company, you do a title search, and you have it traced back to everybody before you to the original land patent. You get a copy of your meets and bounds, usually from your cartographer's office at your county, and you re-describe your property back into meets and bounds, listing the original patent number. And a patent is everything from the top of the dirt down. And it is land. It is private property. It cannot be sold, and it cannot be leaned. It must be granted away to your heirs and they're assigned forever. No one can tax it, the land, the dirt. Nobody can tax it. Nobody can do it. It is a melodial title. It's the king's land, and who is the king? The guy that lives there. Okay? What is real estate? Real estate is everything from the dirt up. That's why you sell real estate they sell the house or the improvements that are on it, the land. Yeah, well, your land just have to go with it. So then they screw with you and they change the deed. They change the deed from a grant deed to a warranty deed. They still just stole your property. Here's another way. When you go in to hold title, you hold title in private property in private in land patent. Not be simple, that's called feudal property. When the king allowed people that served him a feudal title to a piece of property, 
king still owned the property. It's like a long-term lease. As long as that guy fought his wars and did his bidding, he let the guy live there. As soon as he challenged the king, hey, buddy, you're out of here. Okay? And that's what he did. It's a feudal, feudal property. It's fee simple. Now, what is a joint tenants in common? Joint husband and wife. Tenants means renter. Common means state. Joint renters to the state. You didn't really own your property anyway. You just leased it from them. And how the law writes it is, you have the express ability to make a profit or incure a loss. And I lost nine million in real estate because I didn't know this back then. But I knew it now. And I re I corrected my errors. And it's not that hard to do. I taught a good friend of this back in 2008. And he became probably the nation's foremost leading expert on it. And this is his, his first edition of this book. He just doesn't exist yet. First edition of this book, he made one, and he got his property in a little title, and he started teaching at the Southern Oregon Community College Mining Claims Division about a little property, land patents. He became an expert in it. He looked up the laws that I was telling him about. All I, I did was have a telephone conversation with him a couple of times, two or three times for about an hour. And he went down, and the, the examples of his own property are in here in the back. But what he wants me to do is he wants me to perfect this one section where it's the process. And so I went down and I had this book that he handed me right before this trip. I had it digitized down here at the print shop in Logan today on digital format so I can fix those two or three little errors that he has on a few of those pages. Just where he, I mean, he did it right. He just maybe the United States of America incorrectly or that kind of stuff. He knew I knew this stuff. So I'm just going to fix those few pages and then that's going to be in publish. And I'll tell you what, man, this guy knows more than I do now about land patents. And I've, and I've done my own property, but he knows far more than I do. He went to work researching this. I'm so proud of him, I can't stand him. What does that sell for? You can pick one. He hasn't even started selling. <laughs> he just wrote the book. He's been teaching this stuff. Now he's put a book together. I mean, the laws he has found in here, case law after case law. I mean, you could pick one page and go, oh my God, that's all I needed. What was, what was his name, Derek? So, you told me yesterday, but I don't retain very well. <laughs> I don't know why, so I can't see it. His name's Rod, Ron Gibson. He lives, Gibson, in, Gibson, he lives Gibson. in Southern Oregon. Yeah, he's a great Ron guy. Gibson. I know that name. I know him. He's an expert on mines and mining claims. He grew up in the mining industry. Jim? That's how I met him first. Did he do this in the McMinnville area for a while? Southern Oregon. I know there's a Gra Grass Pants Medford. Not Grants Pass. Grass pants. So, <laughs> so, so anyway, can you, yeah. Can you kill property tax with that information then, or is that? Absolutely. It's the duty of the county recorder when you record it to call the county assessor's office and said no more tax on this man's land. <laughs> so they have to the improvements above the land. Can the, city they can. Your, can the city shut your water off and everything because of that? Your power or yeah. no? You said they can still tax the improvements? You know it's illegal for the city to shut your water off and your power off? It's absolutely illegal. Why is that? Because they're shutting it off based off ordinances. Because you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And what is required for life? Water. They cannot shut your water off. Yeah. Dave Miller, some the reason is they asked him, how come they haven't shot you yet? And he said, because he's scattered the information so fast and so far. So far, so fast. That's what I'm trying to do. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs> so what's the difference between that and what Schaefer Cox? Do you know anything about that? I love Schaefer Cox, but it is what it is. 
Okay, I guess we're out of time. I, yeah. Okay. One more question. All right, I saw you had a hand up before. Last one. Two more. Good one. But we, yeah, we're done. Okay. But go ahead. You said they can still tax the improvements of other land? They can. Why don't you put some dirt on your roof? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> now you're talking. I showed you some underground homes that I built. And they're beautiful. You need, to show, you need to go out there and see some stuff on his tablet. It's incredible. I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, Dave, David Strait, ladies and gentlemen, excuse me.